Morning, everyone. So um, we're going to start with a little bit of a, an icebreaker question um, and then get into the serious stuff. And I know that Dolores Mitchell, executive director of the Group Insurance Commission, is ready to go with, um, yeah, we talked about this. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I was going to pretend to be spontaneous. Well, <laughs> I needed to fill time while people were sitting down, though, you know? Okay, so Dolores is going to tell us what is her current health care goal. Health goal, personal health goal. And you'll all in the audience be asked this question if you stand up, so be ready. Well, she saw me just drinking coffee and not having any uh, pastry to go with it, so she suspected I was on a diet. I've been on a diet my entire life, uh, so, so it's nothing new. Uh, and she said, well, I'm going to start by asking people what their personal health goals are. Um, uh, the, the elusive 10 pounds, which of course probably should be 20, uh, getting rid of that, <clears throat> that's goal number one. Uh, I have a method. My method is I diet during the week, sort of. Um, and uh, weekends, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> um, and I decided this is the only way I could possibly continue. Uh, the second thing I do is I did. Uh, I joined a gym, and I threw again through. I'm, I am kind of an impulsive person. <laughs> I uh, joined. I paid dues for the entire year. Uh, this means that unlike all the other gyms I have joined uh, and quit uh, in the middle. Uh, and since it, I drive right past it every single day on my way home, I have no excuse and high motivation to drop in. Uh, and sometimes I actually exercise, and the, and the, <clears throat> which I hate. I admit, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. And I'm never so happy as when I walk out the door to my car. <laughs> uh, and the third thing, Whoa, I don't know if I can say this. Uh, I am going to try, as part of my diet, since... Yeah. Since we all know that alcoholic beverages uh, are very fattening, uh, my weekly abstinence, uh, during the week abstinence program, uh, is included as well. But Friday night when I come home for that first martini, <laughs> let me tell you, it's great. <laughs> so and last but not least, uh, hey, Martha. Uh, Last but not least, as executive director of the Group Insurance Commission, I am uh, uh, sponsoring a program for employees in the Commonwealth called WellMass. And if any of you in this room are state employees, and I see a few of you, I know that you're really dying to get back to the office, but those of you who are state employees, if you have not already signed up for the WellMass program, it's not too late, and you can take a health assessment, which will tell you what you ought to do in case you didn't already know it, uh, and I urge you to do so. And uh, so I'm not only doing it for myself, but for all the rest of the state employees. That's it. Yay. OK, Dolores, you have a new notice out to all of the people who contract with the Group Insurance Commission that says they have to become risk-bearing providers. They have to start assuming some share of the risk. And in that notice, as I was reading it, it says that that move is the single strategy with the best chance of bending the GIC's cost <clears throat> for the long haul. What's the evidence? Why are you so committed? Well, we've tried everything else, and it didn't work. Uh, it's like democracy. What is it? Winston Churchill once said, you know, uh, America is a great country. They, they, after everything else has tried and failed, they finally come to the right answer. Um, and I mean that quite literally. I mean, we've tried just about everything. We've tried disease management. We've tried HMOs. We've tried um, disease management programs. Uh, all of them do some good, uh, but none of them have really hit hard and directly <clears throat> on the issue of costs. Um, and so there is some evidence, and it is evidence from the days of HMOs. I mean, I think we need to be very honest about that. Uh, uh, HMOs did curb costs. Uh, I have, you know, all the graphs in the world that will show you that the trajectory of costs went down in the heyday of HMOs, and then the minute we decided uh, to let the market have sole responsibility for uh, maintaining or, or keeping costs under control, uh, the lid blew off. So having uh, observed that history and lived through it, I was there at the time. Um, and uh, I remember at the time Mike Dukakis saying to me, 
uh, Dolores, your responsibility in this job is to get your arms around the cost monster. Um, and here we are, uh, 25 years later, and it hasn't happened. Uh, so that's why. Okay. Hi, Tom. Chief of the Healthcare Division in Attorney General Martha Coakley's office. How are you? I am well, thank you. Do you have a health goal? Um, it's a personal health goal. Mm -hmm. I, well, I'm also first up. Um, part of a state employee, so as far as the well mass, I, I cycle to work every day, and I have half of the attorneys in my division cycle to work every day. Three, three seasons, they told me that come wintertime, I will be a team of I. <laughs> <laughs> and did it happen all three seasons? We, I, yeah, they, we cycle, um, half the team cycles most of the year. That's cool. Okay, so getting out of business, how does the law change the AG's role in monitoring or undressing undue health care cost increases? What's, what's going to be different in the way you guys do business? Um, well, first off, business is going to be different. And so we'll respond to the changes in the marketplace. And it's not just risk bearing. It's a variety of different um, um, structures that are going to get better information into the marketplace. And it's both from the risk bearing perspective, but also from the perspective of consumers being more engaged and prudent. And that's why I like to see Rick Lord in the front row here, because it's business groups and others doing their part to make sure that, that the market is functioning is going to be very, very important as we go forward. With regard to our work, the Attorney General, and I'm, my, my comments today are my own as opposed to the Attorney General. You've probably all been in conferences with attorneys. Start with that, I should. Um, but with regard to the Attorney General's work, she formed the Health Care Division to do consumer protection enforcement work. So we, we do, in fact, sue health plans and health providers and other types of businesses that try to keep the marketplace from being a level playing field, taking advantage of other businesses or consumers, and providing consumer education and, and information. That's going to be continuing to be an essential function as we go through implementation thinking, how do we enforce this? How do we make sure that those businesses, most of which are trying to do it right, providers, most of whom are trying to do it right, health plans, most of whom are trying to do it right, are given the opportunity to be successful in this marketplace. And so that's where we're going to double our efforts going forward. Um, we also have and we, um, the wonderful legislation, Chapter 224, that uh, Senator Moore and um, uh, Representative Walsh and the legislature put together with the governor's office gives us some new tools to monitor the market, and we're going to uh, meet the, the challenge of uh, providing better information to the market by taking up that, uh, those tools and monitoring the market more aggressively. Senator Moore, you are um, the Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Health Care Financing. What's your personal health goal? Well, I'm Dolores Mitchell's health coach. <laughs> <laughs> and first, I have to tell her that I Wait, have a number Can we videotape these sessions? <laughs> I have a number of studies that say that drinking wine, beer, and scotch every day <laughs> in moderation is good, so don't save it up for the weekend is the first piece of advice. The second one is every time you get that urge to exercise, lie down for a while until that feeling passes and you'll be much better off. Okay, so with that in mind, <laughs> what in this law that has your fingerprints all over it, chapter 224, is going to do the most to cut costs and improve quality? I think, well, there's a lot of parts of the law that I think will do both. Uh, that certainly, we could, you could name a no, number of them. I think the reforms, medical malpractice reforms, I think will be very helpful uh, in, dis, in reducing uh, defensive medicine. Uh, that'll take some time, but I think it will because it has to change a whole culture. But I think the, the real effort is, is giving the providers uh, both a goal and the tools to make the changes they need to make. Uh, we've set a, a goal, a very ambitious goal perhaps, uh, but a goal that uh, I think can be reached and needs to be reached. Uh, and we've, we've put it not rather than become, you know, do price setting or rate fixing or whatever, uh, we've really focused on letting the providers come up with their solution to the plan to get to that goal. And we'll work with them and coach them. And we've made a number of changes in law, both in the insurance law and in the uh, oversight of health care, that we think will help providers to get to that uh, goal. So I, I, I think that's the key, is, is getting, we, we can't continue 
uh, whether it's at the state or national level, uh, to have health care costs rising at this point better than double the normal inflation because you've got to be able to pay for it. And if, you, if you're not uh, keeping pace uh, between the rest of the, rest of the, the economy and health care, uh, we're not going to be able to afford it. And then the quality will suffer, access will suffer, uh, and that's what we want to work against. Thank you. Secretary Bigby? Good morning. How are you? What are you doing to uh, stay healthy? Um, many people know that when I um, started as secretary, my former chief of staff yelled at me one morning and said, no more emails at 3 o'clock in the morning. It makes you look weird. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had this goal for a very long time, and that is to get at least five hours of sleep a night. I'm still working on it, but I'm still trying. Um, okay. Sleep is very important to people. Well, this is, first question is probably going to um, make you stay up late tonight, but anyway. <laughs> there are lots of new uh, roles and responsibilities in the executive branch. I think the Hospital Association has a memo going around about 99 new regulations. A lot of people go, holy molo, mo what's that expression? Holy moly. Thank you. When they think of this, so when you look at this massive undertaking, what do you focus on? What's the first and most important thing? Maybe not first, but what's the most important thing that has to get done right? Well, I think that um, thinking about this bill in terms of the new regulations um, that will come forward um, isn't the most helpful way to think about it. If we look at what we need to do, we really have to acknowledge the fact that what this bill does is says, um, Massachusetts, we're going to put everyone that has anything to do with health care on a budget. And that budget is going to be defined by the Health Policy Commission that is newly created by this bill um, when it defines what the growth should be and how to measure it. The other issues related to uh, the bill that focus on ensuring that we are working together toward the same quality goals, toward the same access goals, toward protecting both consumers and providers as we begin to map out the strategies related to uh, risk bearing, um, and also as we begin to map out um, some of the other initiatives in the bill related to um, a greater focus on prevention, the malpractice reform that Senator Moore talked about, um, all depend on us all having the same kind of data so that we know where we are, we have a sense of where we're going, and we have a good way of measuring where we get, if, of how we get there. So the Health Policy Commission that I mentioned is a new um, state agency that will be responsible for uh, defining some of the things that the state has not uh, previously had to define and measuring, as I said, whether or not we're getting to uh, where we should be and trying to figure out if we're not on target, what are some of the factors that are contributing to that while recognizing that this bill envisions a strategy that says, well, maybe we haven't done enough for primary care and behavioral health. And those are things that we need to shore up and uh, make a stronger foundation if we really want to achieve the outcomes of better care, better quality at lower cost um, that this bill envisions. The new Center for Health Information and Analysis, which is a completely independent organization, um, will be responsible for collecting data, analyzing it, and providing reports so that the legislature, the administration, the public, providers, payers, everyone has the same information um, and is using it in a way to understand what their role is in achieving the three goals that we have here, better care, better health at lower cost. Um, so our focus is really on making sure that as we envision these new uh, agencies, um, that they're ready to begin on November 5th, which is when the bill becomes 
law. Uh, it's the fifth or the sixth senator. I, What's a day? Uh, What's a day? <laughs> <laughs> to David Sells, it's a lot. Um, and so we are busily uh, working to make sure that these agencies um, are ready to go. Um, there are new regulations that will be required, but there's also the opportunity to get rid of regulations that are not consistent with the new way that we're seeing things. So agencies are very busy looking at um, what we need to do in the future and what opportunities we have to get rid of what is unnecessary um, or duplicative so that we don't end up with a morass of uh, bureaucracy that prevents us from moving forward with this. Dolores, I want to come back to where the Secretary started with this whole notion of setting budgets. And again, to your memo that tells plans that I think it's as of 16, you will, you'll expect no premium increases at all. Is that right? What has, we're going. What has to happen to get there? Um, let me say that, you know, the early uh, uh, words, well, no, let me, let me step back one. Um, you know, in an ideal world where everything works out in, in clockwork with everything else, uh, I would not have chosen this particular autumn uh, as the time for uh, the GIC to go out to bid for all of its health plans because uh, we're going to be, uh, we have to be half a step ahead of um, um, the writing of the regulations, for example, or their final adoption and so on. But we made a decision uh, that the law has given us not just a mandate, but a, a, a little bit of uh, the wonderful thing called it's the law. Uh, it's not just the GIC. Uh, and uh, yes, we are going to push that envelope a little <laughs> faster and a little harder uh, than we absolutely have to. But I, I think I'm a great believer in seizing the moment. Uh, and I think the climate is right. Uh, if Every article I pick up uh, in which a, a healthcare provider leader is quoted, they all say exactly the same thing, namely, the time has come, we know we are going to have to do more with fewer resources, and we know that the accountability balance, if you will, is going to be tilted. I view uh, the health plans uh, as my agents uh, working uh, with me and under the guidelines of the contracts that they and we will eventually agree to, to make this thing work. Uh, and that means that it's gonna be a struggle. It's going to be a reach. Um, last year, our premium increases were only 1.43%. I see no reason why we can't do better than that. Uh, and that's the reason that I think um, uh, that we can do it. I think they can do it. Do I think it will be easy? Um, uh, no, uh, I don't. Uh, but I think uh, if, if you don't seize the moment, it will go right past you. Uh, so that's what I'm going to try to do. And I'm looking forward. Uh, I know I'm going to hear first round out. I'm going to hear screams of anguish. Uh, but I think we can get over that. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the challenge. If you don't do a challenge, if you've been in a job as long as I have, which is 25 years, uh, it, life gets awfully boring. Um, so uh, this is not just to amuse Dolores Mitchell, but it's to do something to achieve the triple aim. And, and, and notice that uh, uh, Secretary Bigby used that triple aim three different times, or two different times, the three things. We used to talk about the three stools on which healthcare rested. Access, our goals were access first, and we've done a cracking good job at that. Uh, quality, absolutely, and uh, we've been working very hard on that. And the third one is cost containment. Uh, and uh, Don Berwick put it a slightly different way. Uh, better medical care, better population health, and lowering the per capita cost. And that's my goal, uh, as it is Secretary Bigby's, and as it is the Patrick administration, and thank heavens, as it is with the legislature as well. They've given us the tools. I'm going to use them. But Dolores, in 30 seconds, give me what has to happen in order for premiums to stay flat and then start to decrease, as your notice well, says. Premiums to stay flat simply means that they have to sort of tighten the belt, look where the savings are, uh, while simultaneously, because I know this, uh, the, the uh, 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 integrated risk-bearing 
provider organizations. I have to stop and think what the letters stand for. Um, not going to happen overnight. But there are a lot of them out there already, a substantial number, who could, in fact, start now. Some of them already have started. Um, Andrew Dreyfus, under his leadership, has pushed that uh, particular ball down the court. I hate sports metaphors, but anyhow, uh, a fair distance already. And that's why I think the climate is right. It's going to take those health plans. Oh, this is more than 30 seconds, isn't it? Sorry. Uh, uh, but we've, kept, we've pushed and kept premiums lower than a lot of other purchasers. We, because of our size, we have a little extra clout. There's no question about that. Uh, and I think uh, we're going to push that ball uh, even farther, maybe over the goal line. I, not for lack of trying, let me assure you. Secretary Bigby, I'm going to ask you a question as a primary care doctor now. You know the law expands the definition of primary care providers to include physician assistants, nurse practitioners, some um, mental health providers. How much is that going to change the dynamics for clinicians today, and 15 years from now? So I think that there's a great opportunity there. Um, one answer, and I think uh, I say one answer to your question to Dolores, what ha has to happen, because there is no silver bullet. Um, as you know, the bill has lots of provisions. We have to do all these things together to achieve the outcomes we want. But one of the issues um, that we know we can do better, and this has been shown um, through research across the country, and we have some data in, in Massachusetts, is that we need to do a better job of providing both preventive care and primary care, but also making sure that the most um, expensive populations that uh, represent a small percent of our population, but represent the majority of our healthcare spending, right now uh, they're circling around the healthcare system, uh, consuming a lot of uh, cost, and people think that about 30% of that is unnecessary or duplicative. By engaging a broader array of providers and working in teams um, that acknowledge there are different strengths that those providers bring to the team. Uh, we believe that that will change the way that people experience health care, and uh, doctors can actually spend more time with their complicated patients who have lots of questions. Nurse practitioners can practice at the, type, at the top of their licenses, if you will. The behavioral health providers and primary care physicians um, and other primary care providers can work together um, mm -hmm. to get the type of uh, interventions that people with chronic mental illness and subsub substance abuse have so that they don't end up clogging up our emergency departments um, and ending up repeatedly admitted to the hospital. These are some of the ways that by um, acknowledging the progress that we've made in understanding how to prevent illness, how to manage chronic illness, how to manage people with chronic uh, mental illness has changed over the last 20 years. Our system has not changed to accommodate that new knowledge, and that is what this bill encourages us to do. So in 20 years, I think we'll have a much different system that we have now, and it should be responsive to those um, needs. Senator Moore, one of the most contentious issues was what to do about the disparity between payment and prices at some of the higher cost hospitals and lower cost hospitals. You spoke a little in your um, opening remarks about letting providers decide how to improve their own systems. But how did you think about tackling that issue that seems to be institutionalized in Massachusetts between some providers who can and do demand much higher reimbursement rates than others? Well, they still need to meet the goal of getting their costs in line with inflation. So if you have a high cost system or within it high cost parts of that system, uh, they're going to have to move toward the goal and they'll have to show us how they get to that. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, 
provisions in the bill. Uh, you know, we, Mary Lou Sutters is here somewhere, and, and she and I worked with a number of other people um, a few years ago, 10 years ago, probably, maybe more, uh, for mental health parity. The law really pushes that uh, direction because we know that you know, the chronically ill, who are our highest cost uh, in the, uh, patients, uh, many of them have behavioral health, substance abuse issues that complicate that physical health issue. We can save money and have better quality care. Uh, certainly in the uh, prevention and wellness, we've created the trust fund, and, and we've, we've been doing that since uh, Chapter 58, actually. There were uh, investments in public health then, and with our economy, sometimes they get uh, relaxed a bit too much. Uh, but uh, in, you know, if you don't get sick or injured, health care is pretty cheap. So we want to encourage uh, prevention and wellness, and there's a lot of activity, a lot of provisions in there to do that. Uh, the uh, investments that we make in health IT, now Massachusetts, and the Secretary has been very much involved in this, I know, uh, is probably the, the best state of investing in electronic medical records, uh, computerized uh, provider entry, a variety of the health uh, IT utilization that will make health care better and e easier to coordinate. So I think there's a lot there that will, will come through, and everybody will be, you know, I think as Secretary mentioned the point of everybody working toward the same goals, and they may have different ways of achieving it, but they still have to achieve those goals, and that's, I think, will, will bring a lot of the <coughs> folks that have been maybe on the high end of costs having to become much more efficient to do that, and I, I think that will work. Uh Tom, the last report from the Attorney General said that there was not evidence yet of global payments saving money as compared to fee-for-service. Is that um, still the AG's position? I don't know if you have any, any new data on that. Then if it is your position, what in this bill is going to save money? Um, it, the, it's, as far as position, law, it's, uh, as far as the the Attorney General's position. The reports speak to what is the kind of the best information in the marketplace. Um, with regard to the concept of global payment, the Attorney General sees global payment as one uh, approach that needs to be pursued. And we have to understand the market isn't just a homogenous market. You've got, um, you know, government payer and government payer programs, you know, are different than the commercial market space. How they approach situations where there's chronic conditions is some of the higher cost, uh, you know, kind of patients that Secretary Bigby mentioned is very different than other types of patients. I think we need to be mindful of that the marketplace is going to need to have the tools and flexibilities to find its way forward. With regard to the specific issue of the variation in prices, uh, one, as far as that homogenous approach, it, it could become, you know, somewhat regressive if, if the inflationary cap is applied to all providers and provider systems the same way. If you have a double the, double the rate at this point in time and you're given the same rate increase, you're going to have a yawning difference as far as the overall price in the marketplace. And that's something that we, we can approach not just through, you know, through legislation, and, and I think because I think this is a very, very good bill. We're not looking to change what's there. But to talk about how the market and, and business groups and through tiered products and limited network products and start to address where the volume moves. Because what we benefit from in Massachusetts is extremely good providers. Community hospitals have extremely high quality. And trying to find a way to make sure that there are balanced with, with, uh, with the legislative structure and some of the, some of the processes, some overall arching downward pressure with regard to GSP, but then also making sure that consumers become engaged even more than they have been. And it's been encouraging to see since Chapter 288 the uptake with some of the products in that space. And that, that, that uptake needs to be in two forms. One is with them being more prudent as far as how they use care. But I think it goes to your very um, um, insightful initial questions to all of us, us all taking more responsibility for our personal health and for employers to do the wellness plans that the bill allows and some of the other things so that we can become a healthier Massachusetts. Secretary Bigby, the um, law instructs uh, your office, I believe, to develop a health map that would offer recommendations for what the healthcare landscape should look like in the state, hospitals, doctors, all kinds of facilities. How different do you think that will look when somebody sits down and crafts such a thing from what we have now? Well, I think there's great opportunity to um, not approach this in a how many hospitals do we need, how many beds do we need, how many this and that's do we need, um, but to really think about what kind of healthcare system do we need? So Tom mentioned the fact that community hospitals deliver very high quality care. 
um, we agree with that. Um, one way that we can look at the role of community hospitals is to say, what do they need to do to serve their communities? What are the type of services that they should be delivering? And how do we pay for them and make sure um, that they're able to survive with those payments as opposed to going after the high revenue generating services um, that some people think we already have too many of. Um, I think that the other thing that uh, our health resource planning effort can do is to identify where we're underserved. Um, we have one of the lowest uh, proportions of hospice providers in the country in Massachusetts. And when we look at where people get their end of life care, it's in ICUs, in hospitals. Um, most people say though that when that time comes, they wanna die at home. Um, so how do we fix the system so that we're um, balancing the type of services that people need and that we know our communities need in order to, again, make sure that we are providing healthcare services based on what people want and what they need as opposed to what generates revenue. Is there someone with a question? Hi. Roxanne Reddington Wild of ABCD and the Disparities Action Network. My question is on health access with the high cost of deductibles. I was in Montreal at a family wedding. My stepmother under Canadian health care is in line for a hip replacement. She just has to wait a while, all costs covered. Here in Massachusetts, family friend, working poor, self-employed, has a hip crumbling underneath her. Doctor says get a hip replacement. She has a $4,000 deductible, and she simply is not getting that hip replacement. How do we actually get health care access now that we all have health insurance? I think, first of all, uh, the, the law 224 includes in it a couple of very important studies by the insurance division, uh, particularly, uh, to look at uh, how do we work into the concept of um, flexible spending accounts, health payment accounts, whatever, the, the different te techniques in, in the, the federal tax law, and how do we look at getting, incorporating some of that uh, in our own process, because it's, uh, I think, a, a deductible of for most people, much of a $500 is probably a, it starts to become a, a problem. I remember uh, Eric Schultz, who's now at, at uh, Harvard Pilgrim when he was at Fallon, had someone approach him saying he had a $2,000 deductible, this particular uh, member, and uh, he needed a, uh, uh, a scan that was $1,700. He didn't have it. Um, so it really has, the, that's the, the cost of that, and we need to figure out how do we get that gap in, and if people are going to, elect the lower premium, they've got some responsibility to have put a little bit of that savings aside uh, into the, the account that will help them have the money when they need it uh, to get access to care. Um, we also, I think, do a number of things to try to change the access uh, direction rather than uh, go to the emergency department um, even for you know, relatively you know, non-emergency things to do more with health centers, do more with limited service clinics. Uh, get, giving the nurse practitioners and the physician assistant a greater opportunity to, uh, to help with patients where, where it's appropriate for their uh, particular scope of practice uh, so that we can try to improve access to care uh, that they don't have to uh, wait uh, two or three weeks or more uh, to get to see their, their primary care provider. And so I, I think there are a lot of techniques in the bill that will help that uh, to do it. And we want, we want to, we have, done a lot to uh, lower the cost of, of, uh, of the insurance itself and, and make sure that what, what you're paying for insurance goes more toward health care. Um, I don't know if we have an emergency physician sitting next to Jim Roosevelt, but um, I told him one time, you know, 95% medical loss ratio wouldn't be bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, but, you know, what the federal government's done, and we actually have a little bit tighter standard than the federal government on medical loss ratio of how much insurance has to go for health care. And that's actually shown, you know, the company, many of the companies are, are getting there and doing pretty well. But those that didn't had to actually rebate money to the consumer, which I think was a good thing to help really show that <coughs> we are, we're serious about how much money goes to health care and how much of it just goes to administering the, the whole system. Uh, I'd just like to add a word. I mean, I think the questioner 
uh, posed an important uh, question. I'm not a big fan of high deductible health plans, and it was with the greatest of reluctance that last year, no, year before last, the GIC added what is in the market a very low uh, uh, upfront deductible, but it's my least favorite way of, of uh, covering the cost. But if you take the deductible issue and the premium issue, I think that tells you that we who are on the, either the purchaser side or the payer side or the government side have an education job to do with enrollees. And say, so, look, and that's why I'm so passionate about about making this this bill work, and sooner rather than later, because the odds are, the options are either pay it through high deductibles, pay it through uh, co-pays, pay it through premiums, or make the system more efficient and make it work better. And we've got to get patients to feel comfortable that that's what we're trying to do, rather than thinking that we're taking away some uh, free choice or unlimited choice that they now enjoy. That's a tough sell. That's going to be a tough sell. But I think it's a, it's a, a sell that we have to try. All of us have to try uh, to make persuasive. Otherwise, patients will will resist, and uh, we don't want that to happen. Dolores, do you want to say something on that, Secretary Big? I just I want to make two points. Number one, I don't think that cost shifting to the <clears throat> consumer is cost saving. Um, somebody's still paying for that. And we have seen out of pocket costs go up. The other thing I think we need to do is step back from the notion of where we came, uh, where this idea of uh, co pays and high deductibles come from. They are there to. Uh, encourage people to consume less care or less expensive care. Um, and at the same time that we're encouraging providers to try to improve outcome for their patients with diabetes, high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, whatever, and beginning to monitor their outcomes and reward them for those, we're putting barriers in place for people to take their medicines. Somebody who has diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol is likely to be on six or seven meds a month. Um, no matter how low the copay is, when you add that all up, for some people that's a barrier to taking their meds. We should align our policies so they make sense. We can't reward providers on one hand for doing a good job of managing diabetes and then ask uh, people to um, have to sacrifice in order to take their meds. So we can do a better job, I think, in aligning those policies. Next question. Hi, uh, I'm Steve Shestakovsky. I'm the executive director of the Tobacco Free Mass Coalition. You know, to me, one of the most exciting parts of this law is we finally see a tiny bit of an investment in prevention and wellness. Uh, the cost of health care is enormous. Those costs can be saved, really, if we make a greater investment in the front end. You know, we've seen a number of evidence-based strategies, such as tobacco Steve, cessation. Steve, point it right at your mouth, if you would. The okay, such as, such as tobacco cessation, other evidence-based strategies that really go a long way towards reducing the, health, the cost of health care by keeping people well. Uh, wouldn't it make sense for us to look at an investment of the same magnitude that we did in time and effort regarding uh, payment reform in this legislation to look at the, at the whole uh, health care system itself in terms of being able to put more emphasis and more resources in uh, prevention and wellness. That's, that's really where the long-term savings, I believe, uh, will come from. Steve is asking about the wisdom of more investment in prevention and wellness. I think the, the key is to make sure that, and the, the onus is really on the, the public health folks and on the providers, but to demonstrate the cost effectiveness of the techniques being used. We've seen that with the smoking cessation program. Um, we, we know for a fact that it will reduce cardiovascular issues, number of heart attacks and strokes, within the same budget year, which is key. Um, we know probably it will also save some money on lung cancer later on, but. Um, showing that there's a, a, a direct correlation to uh, saving money and improving the quality of care is going to be an important, just saying, oh, we'll try this new uh, exercise or something without having it analyzed 
uh, and showing that, that it really does good. One of the things we did in the, in the conference committee in the credit that we're allowing for uh, small businesses that have wellness programs, we want, we, you don't just get it because you check the box saying you have a wellness program. You have gotta show that your people are participating in it and that it's doing some good in order to be, access that credit. So we, we wanna see the results, uh, you know, try it first at your, at your risk and then we'll, we'll reward it uh, when, we, when we see that it's working. And I think that will focus on, on strategies that have evidence-based uh, background to them. Sure. Uh, one of the reasons, again, I keep going back to the same point, but uh, one of the reasons that I think the success of this bill is so critical and that the bending, not just bending the cost curve, but lowering the cost is so critical is that health is not just a function of medical care. Uh, and we are starving uh, the rest of the components of health. You know, uh, physical education in public schools, um, uh, transportation um, so that people are discouraged from taking their cars, but in, I'm guilty, uh, but uh, uh, you know, using public transportation and walking to the station and all the rest of it. Uh, you know, uh, better foods, uh, uh, maybe uh, changing what we put into vending machines uh, and so on, uh, using behavioral economics to charge more for Fritos, I love them, uh, <laughs> and less for bottled water. I mean, you know, it, it, there are whole, s and, and doing something about smoking, you're absolutely right, all of those things are very important. But if we spend every single month, dollar we've got available on medical care, there is nothing left for all those other programs which are equally important for health. Sorry. Hi, Josh. Hi. How are you? Good. This is on. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is Josh Archambault. I'm at the, the Pioneer Institute, a think tank here in town. Uh, this is a question for Secretary Bigby, Senator Moore, and Dolores. I know a few stakeholders um, have said to me that they believe the law authorizes them or to directly contract with state programs, so GIC, Mass Health, potentially in the future, or Commonwealth Care. Is there truth to having the state directly contract with an ACO in the future? Um, yes, I think that is a possibility as uh, providers um, become more integrated, they take on risk and as the division of insurance works to define uh, what a risk uh, taking provider is, um, I hope that we'll see different ranges of that um, we've already got providers and health plans working together in several instances um, in the state. And so I think that the, the red line distinction between um, health plans and providers will become less distinct and it is possible that um, providers could be contracting directly. But I, I will add that um, there is an incredible role that we have to acknowledge that health plans play. Um, as we emerge from this transformation that we're going through, there is no reason to reproduce the infrastructure, data gathering, data reporting, um, and other tools that are embedded in health plans that we need in order to um, make this uh, next stage of reform successful. And I think we're already seeing uh, providers and insurers working together, beginning to, to partner, uh, rather than providers trying to take on um, excessive risk. And if they, if they want to take on financial risk, they'll need to consult with the insurance division and, and become uh, another insurance company, basically, to do that. So. The partnering, I think, makes sense, uh, and uh, the thrust throughout the bill is also to not simply save money, but to also make sure that the quality is there too. We, I mean, you can cut costs by reducing access or uh, or reducing the quality of care. We don't want to see that kind of cost cutting. We want to see our continued strong access that we have now, and even if we can get better, to even do more than that. I don't know if we can get more than. Uh, 98, 99 percent. That's that's not bad, uh, but I think uh, you know the more we we don't want to rest until we make sure that that everybody has access 
to care and that that care is safe uh, and of good quality care in order to make sense. And, and otherwise, people are going to, um, I think, re re rebel as they did back in the 90s to uh, the cost cutting that didn't include a, a clear uh, connection to the quality of care and expansion of care. Um. Let me say my first preference is not uh, to be uh, uh, purchasing directly from providers, if for no re other reasons, out of parsimony. We're a small agency, uh, and there are a lot of providers and provider organizations out there, and the mechanics of it strike me as kind of terrifying. Uh, having said that, I would say to, to uh, the, the health plans that are about to bid on our business, uh, I take this, you should take this as a challenge uh, to, to, to demonstrate your ability uh, to make this work. Because if you don't, you'll leave us with very little option except to go directly to the providers. And I'd rather not do that. I think, as Secretary Bigby pointed out quite correctly, there are some very important functions that health plans do that are probably not feasible. Or, well, maybe they're feasible, but they're not economically feasible for providers to have to be responsible for. So uh, I would say that uh, now's the time to, to show what, what you can do. We're going to take one question here and one down here, and that'll be it. Sorry, Mary Lou. Hi, Amy McNulty, and I'm Project Director for Community Care Linkages. And um, one of the uh, sort of most important opportunities we have with both the Massachusetts and the national health reform initiatives is to improve care coordination and care transitions across provider settings, all the way into the community. And my question to anyone who wants to answer up there is um, where in this law do you see the opportunity to provide technical assistance, education, support for our providers, our healthcare systems, to actually connect with the existing resources in the community, how we actually make that link, and um, instead of uh, really duplicating what already exists, but to make sure that the providers understand the capacity and, s and services that exist out there. Well, one, one of the areas is that we provided some resources for that. The, there's been, a ter I think, a terrific misunderstanding by some uh, of the funds that the trust fund that was set up for, it's in, in theory we call it, we refer to it because we commonly call them distressed hospitals. Almost every hospital is distressed by their definition anyway, uh, perhaps by others. Uh, but to the, the purpose of that money is not simply to, to raise somebody's bottom line, take it from the haves and give it to the have-nots. Uh, someone called it the Robin Hood approach. It's actually not that, not that way. It's quite the reverse. It's to help uh, all of health care, particularly the community hospitals and the health centers, uh, to look at uh, what do they need to do to, to help in their transformation which would include exactly what you've been saying. Uh, do you have to have additional personnel? Do you have to have additional technology? Uh, whatever, the, to reconfigure your whole uh, business plan, uh, grants for that sort of thing, not just to stabilize somebody's bottom line, because that's, uh, that's a good, you know, it's supposed to be a one-time fund. We do it once and they don't stay, they, you know, it still isn't stabilized if they haven't changed their, their game plan. It's really to help them uh, make the investments in changing their game plan so they do work toward global payments and medical homes and working with community and public health and prevention. Last question down here. Philip Vanderweese. And I'm from Harvard Medical School. Would you mind saying your name again, please, sir? My name is Philip Vanderweese from Harvard Medical School and Rand Corporation. Um, one of the critical notions of the law has been that it may lack the teeth to enforce the cost containment goals. Um, what I like about the law is that it provides the tools and the, and the goals, as Senator Moore uh, mentioned, and that creates a shared responsibility of, of stakeholders. Um, I also sense at this point that there is a, a joint sense of urgency and a momentum of all the stakeholders that they want to, you know, to really move forward with this. But my question is, how do we make sure that we maintain this current momentum and sense of urgency over the years, that it doesn't fade away as soon as the novelty of the new legislation will fade uh, from the attention of people. So how to make sure that this will keep on going over the next few years? Well, I, we, we purposely in the legislature did not want to get into um, over-regulating uh, the, the business. There's a lot of regulations as it is in healthcare uh, and regulating in the sense of, of price setting, rate setting, 
um, was something we, we didn't want to do, certainly without um, the kind of information that's needed to be able to do that properly, which we just still don't, don't really have available in setting rates uh, as to what, the, what a fair rate and appropriate rate for good quality care is. Um, so we didn't want to do that. But the the pressure is going to be on uh, partly um, from consumers, whether they're businesses or individuals or somebody else, uh, if there is anybody else. Um, the, you know, they're, they're, they're still, uh, in order to make, the, and, and by state government, frankly, in order to make the investments that business needs to can be competitive in the global marketplace, that government needs to be able to provide the range of services that we're called upon to provide, um, we have to find, uh, keep the pressure on. So I don't think it's some, gonna be something that will just go away. Um, it's not gonna be, cost containment, I don't think will be achieved overnight. I wish it could be, but I don't think that's likely to happen. It's gonna take some years, several years, to, to really show uh, the trend in the right direction. And uh, it's, you know, I, I had uh, some fun with Secretary Bigby, she probably wasn't ha laughing, um, when, uh, when we had the first press conference with the governor talking about implementing Chapter 58. And I said to her, you know, if this thing doesn't work, you're gone. Um, and so I just renew that with this. <laughs> Uh, but that it's, uh, it, it's true, they, we, we have to all, you know, we're working together as state government and with the providers and with the payers uh, and ultimately with the public. Uh, it's, that, that's gonna be, you have to continue to put the pressure on. I think the biggest problem uh, that we have is probably on the uh, individual side of getting people to change uh, their habits. Um, one of, you know, that's an area that it's very tough to do to get people, we've seen it with drunk driving, we still have too many people out there drinking and driving. We've seen it with smoking. We've seen it with so many things, and and uh, you know this uh, the intent is and the pressure is on the payers and the providers really to educate their members, whatever, or their clients or their patients, whatever you want to call it, um, to live better and not have their health continue. And we've got if we can do that with young people to start with, particularly, and there's an effort certainly uh, the first lady uh, nationally has been promoting uh, that sort of thing, we need to continue that, that kind of a theme, then as we get more people to stick with that through life, that's gonna be important. That's why the th pressure on the wellness uh, and the, the funding for wellness and things that we put in the bill, we need to continue that throughout and that will keep pressure on, I think. So we can't just tell them to lie down? That won't work? Um, just uh, Dolores and I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, you got something to add there? Sure, sure, because it's a very good question. And I think that we are in a different system now. It, while, the, while there much needs to be done, the real work is in front of us. When I say a different system, we're moving from an opaque system with bad information, kind of driving cost plus budgeting. And whether it's through tiered products or through risk-based products, we're moving to a place where employers are much more sophisticated, consumers need to become more sophisticated. Um, the public reporting and the good work that the Division of Healthcare Finance and Policy has, has, has started and we'll continue is, is Chia on TME reporting price relativities, price disclosures directly to consumers. These are opportunities for folks, I'm not suggesting we're gonna have a market um, in healthcare that's gonna be equivalent to a commodities market, but we certainly believe that there can be a lot more pressure and will be with good information driving those decisions. Round of applause for our panel. Come back in 10 minutes. Five, Bill says five.